All right, so, okay, so, so let's talk about, um, again, another thing I'll have to figure out the right setting. Um, so today we're just going to talk about an overall sense of the coast. And when we talk about the coast, what do we mean? I would argue, and, and hopefully you'll be convinced of this by the end of, the, of this lecture and or the end of this class, that the coast is an incredibly dynamic place, much more complex than most people um, understand. So we'll start out with this, and I'm going I'm to be leading you guys through a story about this. Before we start with this, though, let's, let's start with a little something from this weekend. So this is a picture from Summerland Beach, just, just about six miles south of downtown Santa Barbara. This is just below Lookout Beach. And, and tell me what you guys see here in this picture in terms of, in this fisheye view of the beach in terms of management issues. What's again? Yeah, yeah, right, good. So, so um, um, right here we have some horse, uh, horseshoe prints. So the a horse was walking this way. Cool. Rack. Rack. Okay, so we have some some pieces of algae that were growing attached to the bottom of the ocean, broke off, and that stuff becomes by definition rack. Rack spelled with a W, W R A C K, and that stuff washes in, and that that nourishes a whole food web on the beach and not not just on the beach off offshore as well but but on the beach here that we're looking at um, critters will start insects will start laying eggs in that and other things will start grazing on it etc cool other other management things or other issues you guys might see in this fi picture say again that's right excellent a lot of a lot of horse crapola right little road apples going on right here excellent you can see those you can see those right there, right there. So um, we, normally we think of things like dogs on the beach and dogs going to the bathroom on the beach, but, but a whole host of domestic animals could mess with stuff. In the cooks, we had dead pigs on the beach and chickens uh, foraging, pecking in the inner tidal and stuff. So all kinds of domestic critters could be um, impacting our coastal zone. What else, what else do you guys see from that picture? Right, so this stuff. So what looks to be sort of uh, f like a f con either concentric or fans of brown, that's not normally there. That's a, we're in the middle of a very heavy oiling event. Either a very intense seep activity, which is a natural phenomenon in this part of the world. It's why we have oil rigs here. It didn't come after the oil rigs. It, it, they, um, they attracted the people that were looking for oil, oil to here because oil is so close to the surface and, and our rock formations are fractured such that we have oil bubbling up all the time. But this is a super high end of that. This, this, this is much elevated over background levels. Still possibly within the realm of, of uh, natural variation could also be, we might be having a leaking oil, uh, abandoned oil well head out there possibly or something like that but yeah so okay so we got we got oil being deposited in the beach that's not good anything else you guys see in the, this image pebbles. pebbles okay good so if we look there's actually kids making sand castles right here and they've taken a bunch of these rocks and they've piled them up and they've changed stuff so is this really going to kill stuff on the beach no but the fact that people are manipulating the sand, manipulating the rack, manipulating the, the hard structures, that's gonna influence stuff as well. The critters that live there, things that pass through the area. What else? Anything else you guys see? So the coastline itself is incredibly artificial here. So we have things like these boulders that have been dumped here to stop to stop waves hitting the the bluffs and eroding them. We have a bunch of people that made their own private entrances to the beach that you cannot use. That's just for them. We have houses up on the bluff. Associated with those houses are things like non-native plants that they've planted either intentionally or very often they started up here, but then because they are watering and the plants, you know, do their stuff, they, they start to spill out and grow down down the, the bluff side down to the beach. So here's what that looks like in terms of a video. 
no shortage of challenges here in our sandy beaches here in Southern California. In this case, in Summerlin, we have a lot of oil washing up in the beach. That's what the stranding you're seeing here is. There's a bunch of um, horse apples, a bunch of uh, horse waste with people riding their horses here on the beach. Um, then we have kids playing here and then having fun in the sand, but right above them we have a rundo non-native plant development all across the bluff line, almost all non-native vegetation on the hill slope here. So we have oil, we have animal waste, we have um, all kinds of uses of this very, very thin coastal zone, and it makes for a challenging environment, and it's no wonder that many of our beaches are in trouble. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so that's, that's sort of setting the stage. Let's talk about some of the, the, the unique and interesting things about our coast. Let's get a sense for what we mean when we talk about the coastline or the coast. So we're gonna get back to this photo, but this photo is a, a famous person. Uh, and this, this guy is checking out this stranded blue whale in Northern California. This is um, a long time ago. This is 30 odd years ago, this is 1981. And this is at the time, this is the largest uh, such blue whale uh, known to have stranded, in, at least in, in our part of the world. So, um, so he's checking it out, and we'll see what, how this plays into stuff. But it's very clear that the ocean is, is incredibly powerful all across our society. It's powerful for our economics. It's pow powerful for our conceptualization of who we are. Um, it just goes on and on and on. Nourishment. Uh, for the brain, nourishment for the body, etc. And what we find is that um, really healthy coastal systems, and we'll be seeing examples of well-functioning coastal systems, examples of poorly managed, poorly functioning coastal systems, and then everything in between. And there really is this strong inter, uh, interplay between areas that are really productive in terms of biological um, fixation of sunlight into other forms of energy or structures that we can utilize um, and also and also how humans have come to utilize that material and that energy and then how we have modified those both those things over time so there's this huge interplay between the stuff that's in the coast what we do to them and then how that stuff we do in terms of affects what's on the coast and then we change how we're doing stuff so it's this constant interplay back and forth here are just a few examples. One of the classic things that we get from the co coastal zones tend to be very, very productive. So in this case, this is a hunter and uh, sitting in a, in a hunting blind and uh, a bunch around this blind have been deployed all these decoy ducks, so fake ducks, to draw, to draw in um, waterfowl close enough so that that person can shoot them, get them, and so then you can get sustenance, right? You get food. So it could be in the form of flying things, it could be in the form of swimming things, but a very productive area these systems are. Um, and I think sometimes, uh, increasingly, we tend, we tend to have a view of hunters uh, as somehow bad or somehow not contributing to what's going on. Um, Well-managed hunting uh, and, and hunting efforts are some of the best conservation practices that we have. So the reason we have um, so many, especially in the central part of our country, wetlands preserved were, be, were quite frankly because of the, the waterfowl and the duck hunters that created, uh, amongst other things, Ducks Unlimited. And those folks, those responsible hunters, um, don't want to travel to Africa, for example, and blow away a lion, right? That's, that's for people with small, uh, small person complex and people that think they need to somehow prove they're a macho person or something like that. True hunters wouldn't, that, that I, and I know many of these folks, they're not interested in that kind of stuff and they're offended by that type of trophy hunting just as um, many of us are. But, but to be a good hunter in the coastal zone and elsewhere really requires you understand the seasons, the, the migration patterns, the ecology, the behavior, and, and um, and again, responsible hunting is, is a, can be a fantastic tool for uh, management of these landscapes and seascapes. Then there's just all kinds of wonderful, crazy awesomeness that happens. So um, we're about to go into an El Nino situation. It's going to be a crazy few months here. It's, you guys are really lucky to be, uh, to be able to see what's going to happen. I, I mean, well, I say that now, probably 
something horrible will happen, and then I'll say, oh, sorry. But, um, but um, sometimes when we get really heavy El Nino flows, that changes the amount of water and nutrients that are in, that are running off into our coastal waters. And that in turn can induce some really crazy algal bloom situations. What we're looking at here, these, aren't, these are not photoshopped images. These are images with just a long um, shutter exposure. And what we're looking at here are single-celled critters, photos, um, um, uh, bioluminescent organisms, and these are classic red tides. And so these are the kind of things you, you, if you haven't seen these in person, these are things you might have heard of if you like shellfish. And people say, oh, you can't eat shellfish this time of the year or from this particular locale because there's an algal bloom. And these, these shellfish, these filter feeding mollusks, are feeding on those guys. And they're not killing them, but they, they maybe accumulate some of these toxins that would be, make you sick if you were to eat them. Another less known, uh, less well-known aspect is when we have these, re uh, these, these blooms, these algal blooms, these red tides, incredible amounts of these critters. And I remember on various trips in the middle of the ocean where the prop wash, the, the, the screws, the propellers at the bo bottom of the boat, um, everywhere they would touch the water, every time they would cut through the water, they would stimulate. And what's going on is these guys are getting bumped. The blue you see are little teeny single cell guys that are getting bumped. Bumped because somebody bumped into them or bumped because the water bumped them into a fellow alga or whatever it is. And they're like, ah! And so their response to like bumping is like, don't eat me! And so their response is to glow, with the idea being if you were a predator about to eat them, you glow, and then that predator gets lit up. And so that predator would be vulnerable for biting you, is, is, is the theory, at least. And so what we're seeing here, this is mechanical disturbance. In the case on the left, this is the tide. This is, this is the, the, the wave breaking on the beach. And this stuff is crazy. So if you look at it from the air, it looks like this. If you put a mask on and put your head in the water, it looks just like the Sorcerer's Apprentice. It looks like Mickey um, doing a Fantasia thing. It's a thousand little teeny pinpricks of light. And when you move your hand, it's just like Mickey Mouse it's, or a magician. It's whoosh. And it's really, really crazy amazing. So if you guys ever had the chance to go snorkel or dive in a, a, some relatively clear water where there's one of these bloom events going on, you should totally do it. It is the coolest thing in the world. It's way better than video games and everything else. And these pictures over here on the right are just some other examples of, um, of these guys glowing, in this case, in the Bahamas. OK, uh, we've, we've had a long history of harvesting resources, not just biological, from the coastal zone. So what I'm, you guys are looking at here um, is essentially people utilizing the fact that the land and the ocean heat at different rates. That, cre that creates wind and relatively consistent winds. So in the coastal zone, we, we tend to have offshore winds, uh, winds blowing off the shore at some times of the year, uh, winds blowing onshore at other times of the year, et cetera. And they tend to go towards the water or from the water. They tend not to go along the coast in most cases. And so people figured this out. And so we started doing things um, like putting up windmills. And so this was first done in a big bad way in, Euro in Northern Europe. Um, but rapidly spread around. You guys can think of the Dutch windmills. Um, and this just continues. So people first did those to do things like pump water. Then they realized we could harvest their, those, that, um, that mechanical energy for commercial production. And we could do things like mill, mill wheat or stuff like that. Our modern era has things such as Cape Wind, which appears to not be happening now because the people that... Uh, well, we'll discuss why that, why that is later. But suffice it to say, uh, this is the offshore wind um, that people are now using this to generate electricity that is not as um, damaging to the planet as our typical fossil fuels. The, here in California, the coastal zone is incredibly important to every part of our identity. Some parts of the, almost everywhere around the world when you're in the coastal zone, you know you're in the coastal zone, but especially here in Southern California, we've defined whole industries based around this. Anybody know where this is? Any surfers here? This is Trestles. Anybody know where Trestles is? This is, we're talking the sort of southern part of Orange County, northern San Diego area, near San Onofre, near, near the, 
the nuclear generation station that's now currently inoperative. It's around there. And so it's called Trestles because you walk there to State Beach. It's called Trestles because you walk there over these train uh, trestles. Um, but, uh, you know, incredibly um, potent are surfers. And when I was going to college, if somebody told me that surfers were incredibly powerful, I'd say, you are crazy. Because most of my surfer friends were most of the time stoned off their butt. They were very nice people. But I would, I, the notion of confrontation in them didn't, that doesn't, didn't jive with me. Um, surfers formed the Surfrider Foundation. The Surfrider Foundation has been one of the most, if we just take Ventura County, been one of the most efficacious uh, environmental advocacy, ad, advocacy groups, I can't speak today, um, of anything. They're laser focused on the health of the coast and the health of people recreating in the coast. So uh, to have a healthy place to surf means that you have um, not a lot of bacteria coming off on your rivers, means that you don't have an eroding beach that's disappearing because people are throwing horrible structures in the water, means that you don't have a Matilla hot dam that is catching all the sediment and, and causing problems. So Surfrider has been incredibly effective in lobbying for very specific improvements um, to the environment and the human health worlds of the near shore environment. Then we have things like volleyball. Anybody play volleyball here? My, my son's a pro volleyball player. A pro volleyball player? <laughs> what? <laughs> then how can they, we have to have a, a departmental seminar and we have to have some, yeah, we have to have some volleyball instruction. I'll tell them. <laughs> my son, my son is named after a professional volleyball player. Uh, that's, an, that's a story I'll tell you later. But, um, but uh, uh, his middle name is named after a professional volleyball player because, um, yeah, I'll tell you that story later. We're, we're on a drive somewhere or something. But, yeah, so beach volleyball. So beach volleyball, really? It's just some, again, like the surface, just some people hanging out playing volleyball, right? It's, it's, it, you know, grew incredibly uh, in the decades following its introduction. And did things like inspire this whole beach culture lifestyle. So this is, do you guys even know who this is? Right. <laughs> yeah, so we're so old. Do, do, do you know what the movie the, from, this is from? Uh, it's Gidget. The Gidget series. So yeah, so we're too old. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't ever see these movies either. But, but um, if, you know, my parents, very, very important. My, my mother-in-law, one of her, part of her email address references Gidget. So I mean, it was, it was, a, big, it was a big thing back then. This is Annette Funicello, and, and this is this whole crew. This is based on this real woman surfer uh, in Malibu. And she inspired a book. And then that inspired the series of movies. And this series of movies in the 50s, in this post-war culture, when America was really looking for you know, we'd fought all, the, had all this incredible sacrifice. People saw these horrible things with war. They were really looking for something they could, you know, just relax on and whatever. And the beach was one of the key things that were, that were proffered up in terms of popular culture to do that. So this is, this is surfing and this is volleyball and this is campfires on the beach. And I mean, it's, it's for a certain socioeconomic class, but still it created this this um, ideal, and, and Southern California in particular came to be associated with this type of activity. Um, since then, these activities like surfing, like volleyball, have grown tremendously into tr almost trillion dollar industries in some cases. Definitely many tens or hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, and th in, th in this case, I was, um, we just had the, the World Championships this weekend in Long Beach with volleyball, but now this is, this is volleyball, right? And it, so it's volleyball that we, sand volleyball, and we do that, but we do things like now play it in England, we play it in the snow, it's an Olympic sport, and it's just crazy, right? It's gone all around the world. Some of the best players now are not even necessarily from a country that has a beach. So incredible uh, influence. And we can look at um, people playing this all over. This is Manhattan Beach over here on the upper left. There's a, here's a, a volleyball tournament on the right. Manhattan Beach, uh, which is where the tournament where my son got his middle name from, um, a free tournament, right? So anybody can come. Um, it need not necessarily be some kind of elitist, something like on a golf course or something. Um, but uh, yeah, right, so volleyball. I'm rambling on about volleyball. Okay, so we can talk about that. We can talk about the fish 
history, the, the, the extraction of fish, and we'll spend a lot of time in this class talking about that. In this case, we're looking at the port of Los Angeles, uh, LA Long Beach Harbor. Um, and uh, again, just like with the other stuff, World War II, an incredibly important date for us. We talk about things like the colonial period, when the Europeans came over to the Americas or to Africa and did stuff, huge period. Another massively important period was the end of World War II. We invented a ton of technologies to slaughter people because that's what our species loves to do. Uh, incredibly powerful winches, incredibly efficient boats, radar, fish finders, satellite technology, all this stuff that was birthed out of uh, humans hate for one another and attempt to slaughter us at the end of the war was turned towards the natural world. And so, so you see on the, on the right, we start to mechanize what used to be done by human labor, human hands, human backs, and now is done increasingly mechanically. And, and the assembly line model is brought over to uh, what's been going on. So here's a qu quote from uh, the Star Kissed uh, company back in the day. And so it said, at the new Starkist plant formed in 1954, after World War II, the canneries became mechanized factories. At conveyor belt tables with spaces for more than 50 workers on either side, cannery women were a blur of activity. Right? So we created this onslaught in terms of not just the species we were taking out of the ocean, but the, the intensity and the speed with which we were taking these guys out of the harbor. And so we go from, from relatively small scale fishing to mechanized massive scale fishing. I'll tell you some stories about uh, some crazy big ships when we get to talking about that. Another key theme is that the coast is unlike everywhere else. The coast is different from the rest of where humans live. And most people don't understand this. Most politicians do not understand this. Most managers don't properly understand this. What we're looking at right here is the, the growth from 1970 to basically now and on into the future of the o U.S. overall, okay? And then, and this is expressed as a, as a density thing here, okay? We can express however we want. But basically, it's, it's number of folks. We're obviously adding more and more people to the United States every year. Population growth, a, a major challenge. But if we talk about what's going on in the interior of the U.S., meaning a county that does not touch the ocean or the Great Lakes. Um, you see, it's pretty much the same story. Yep, it's more and more people, more and more people. But if we separate out the counties that touch the ocean, it's, it's a vastly different rate. And that's, we'll see that repeated on and on and on throughout our class. So this is something that uh, you guys can play with. Um, later, I'll, I'll post this link and you guys can go do this or, or you can just simply Google state of the coast and it'll be the third or fourth link you get. And this is a viewer. This, this, the state of the coast is a periodic report that the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, puts together. But they, they did a nice thing a couple years ago where they put this in a geospatial context. So you can do a viewer. Instead of just reading the text, you can actually go and look at it in a, in a spatially explicit way. And I just have a couple screen grabs from here. Um, so the first thing to say is that these watersheds that are touching the coast, um, directly touching the coast, um, have added about 51 million people, more than that now, but a couple years ago when I made the slide, about 51 million people um, just since I was born. That's huge. Um, and if we look at the change, what we see is some areas are changing uh, slower, some areas are changing faster. If we talk about the economy, though, the economy of the coast dwarfs everything else. This is being represented by the US. We see the same story in China. We see the same story in Europe. We see the same thing around the world. So um, if we took uh, just the gross domestic product from the US coast, that would, that would turn us into the number two um, most uh, economically productive country in the world, right? The coast is where all the action is. Um, we can look at the, the port activity, right? We, we tend to think of airplanes these days in terms of 
uh, uh, in terms of international economy. When we want to go somewhere, we usually don't get on a boat. We usually get on an airplane, right? And some things like tuna for the sushi restaurant you're going to go to this weekend, um, that will often fly on a, on a jet airplane. But the vast majority of materials that are in this building right now, the vast majority of materials that you go and buy, if they didn't come from our local county or, or nearby, they probably traveled by ship. And so these ports are tremendously important. These, these ports are really, really key economic players that have huge implications for the rest of the region, the rest of the state, et cetera. And so in 2010, it was something like $2.2 .2 trillion worth of imports only, not, not talking about exports, just stuff we brought into the country. I grew up in Northern California. I'm from Northern California. And uh, it's a little bit like, so I went to UCLA for my PhD, but I worked at a marine lab run by the University of Southern California um, because U University of Southern California didn't have any marine scientists. So they had a, a killer lab, but they, didn't, they were much more interested in funding things they thought that they could make money with, and they weren't really interested in funding marine science. Um, and so, so when I was at UCLA, um, there's always this, oh, you go to UCLA, you know, kind of thing, especially if there's a football game on or a basketball game on. But pretty much after the sports season died down, it was like, it's all good. Most of the people at UCLA were like, oh, okay, it's cool, let's go over here and do that. No, not a big deal. People at USC were like, you, you bastard. <laughs> you, you were over there. And I can tell you stories about that too later. Um, but a very similar phenomenon exists in Northern California versus Southern California. Is everybody here from Southern California? Is anybody from Northern California? Okay, right, yeah, so you guys, you see, it doesn't, doesn't really, you won't understand what I'm saying, probably. But suffice it to say, in Northern California, when I was growing up, oh, those Southern California bastards, <laughs> right? They take all our water. So we're, we're in a much worse drought situation now. But when I was a young kid, we, we had a, a bad drought as well. And so the key fact everybody would report was, they said, oh, you guys got to cut back on your water. And so, you know, Marin County, Contra Costa County, all these counties around the San Francisco Bay Area, they reduced their, you know, water by, you know, 17% or 18%. People were putting bricks in the toilets. Like, what the hell is there a brick in the toilet, right? Like, well, it's saving water and everything. And then I remember people saying, oh, the people in Los Angeles reduced their water by 2.5%. Or they reduced their water use by 3%, right? It was always this, those people, right? Whereas you come to Southern California, everybody's got sunglasses on. Like, what's up, dude? I was like, I was like, like, they didn't know that we hated them, right? <laughs> but yet there's this, this whole thing put forth that there's this Northern California, Southern California rivalry, right? I went to school up north at Sonoma State, so it was like a huge... Right. Like the Giants and then I'm from LA. Right. So it totally. <laughs> right, exactly. It's a war zone. Absolutely. <clears throat> so this is how it's portrayed, northern versus southern. The reality is that's not, what our, that's not how our state's divided. This is how our state is divided. In every single possible metric you can, you can think of, this map on the right is predictive of just about everything. <clears throat> Educational income, economics, um, um, voting, uh, political affiliations, all that kind of stuff. The key differentiator in our state is if you live next to the coast or if you live inland. So here are some examples of that. So this is, uh, in this case, this is north versus south, and this is how people are distributed. So back in the day, way back when the state was early, most of the people were in this yellow bar were in Northern California. That's where San Francisco was, the big massive metropolis. That's where Sacramento was, the big political powerhouse, uh, uh, um, uh, all the political power was. But then over time, as we get towards World War II, we see this huge population shift to Southern California with the military industrial complex, with aerospace, et cetera. And it's pretty much remained that way. We're a, we're a Southern California biased state now in terms of um, just the gross number of people. Um, but as different, as different as that was, this is the inland versus the coastal. It doesn't even count. So this is really where everybody wants to be at the coast. The coast, it's cooler. The coast is more hip. The coast, there's more universities. It goes on and on and on. And so uh, what we see is, is the, 
we don't need to look at this graph too in too much detail because I haven't updated it in the last couple of years. But the trend is consistent. The trend is that the inland communities are are declining in terms of economic output, or they're staying the same. The areas of all the huge growth are places like Silicon Valley, are places like Los Angeles. So the action is in the coast. So the coast and inland are different, and every year they get more and more different. Um, and it's important to say that again, this is not just a California phenomenon. We see this all around the um, uh, all around the world, in that um, humans really like to be in the coastal zone. Now, it, it it gets to how we define the coastal zone. Some people say the coast zone is 20 kilometers with with you know from the coast. Some say it's 50. Some say it's 100. So these numbers will shift a little based on on which of those distances we use but the pattern is consistent and robust okay let's talk about how we use coastal systems um all these things are just but a few you guys could probably rattle off another 20 but we do things like harvest biological resources things like kelp things like fish things like birds um we throw our waste into the ocean the solution to pollution is dilution right so that's why our effluent pipes end in the ocean. You dump it in there and there's so much massive water there, it's gonna dilute it. When there were a billion people on the planet, that was probably fine. As we've passed the seven billion dollar, uh, seven billion dollar, as we've passed the seven billion person mark and are heading towards perhaps nine or 10 or maybe even 11 billion people on the planet, that doesn't really work anymore but yet we still behave as if we just throw stuff into the near shore waters and we're good to go um, increasingly to meet our our caloric demands we we have just effectively destroyed or at least maximally extracted the biological resources uh, for food that are out there in a, in a naturally growing condition increasingly we need to augment these we need to farm things in the ocean. We need to do mariculture, aquaculture type of stuff and cultivate those things. Minerals and energy extraction. So obviously the oil extraction is a, is a huge thing for us, not just there. The Cook Islands from this, this summer, they're, they're attempting to figure out how to um, responsibly harvest minerals from the bottom of their ocean. So this is going on. This is not some science fiction talk. This is actually either happening or getting ready to happen. Um, of course, for transportation, ships across the ocean, cargo, tankers moving across the Pacific, etc. Obviously, national defense is a huge deal. Oceans are very important. We'll talk about some of the silliness that's going on in the South China Sea now. And it's all about, get out of my ocean, right? And how do you prove you're a man? It's almost all men doing this. How do you prove you're a man? Yeah. Is, that's right. That's right. You get, get a big thing that blows stuff up and drive it around and tell people lack. This is cool. Um, uh, this touches on urban development and the runoff that, that comes from our terrestrial area into our aquatic areas. And then, of course, things like tourism, recreation, entertainment, ecotourism, going on whale watching trips to the Channel Islands, <clears throat> just going and hanging out on the beach and getting a suntan, that kind of stuff. Um, as I said before, um, and you guys know this, but it's worth restating, that for most of human history, the ocean was this vast, 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 endless thing, right? And we could never get across it. We could never suck the last fish out. We could never put too much poop in there such that we wouldn't, we would have a problem. Those days have basically ended. We've, we've, the ocean is a finite resource we now understand. The coastal zone is also an interesting place because um, while the marine environment is also cool, the coastal zone from a management perspective is unique. The coastal zone is a line. There is a place where the water touches the air. It's usually linear. And that means that we can't go another five miles that way or another 10 miles that way in most cases. This is, this is where it is. If I want my rock star mansion, it's got to be right here. If I want my endangered breeding bird uh, colony protected, it has to be protected here. It can't be protected 10 miles inland. That's not always the case. When we talk about where, we're, where are we gonna put a, a windmill, we could maybe put it right over there, we could maybe put it over there, whatever. 
coastal zone stuff, the coastal zone is a, is a two-dimensional place. It's not three-dimensional. It's, it's this line. And so that concentrates everyone in this very small area. And that leads to an incredibly high concentration of conflicts over the coastal zone. And so uh, everybody wants, either we all want the sand and there's only one place to get the sand, so we're competing for this, this resource. Or the view, it could be the view, who's got the best view, that kind of stuff. Um, and because we're so cheek to jowl with one another, a lot of times, it doesn't have to be, but in many cases, if I get my view, you're screwed, right? If I put up my house to have a killer view, the property right behind me does not have a killer view. So the, f so the fact that I use this resource hurts someone else. Another classic example would be, um, uh, for example, in the Cooks this summer, a, a very popular thing are these uh, kite surfers guys, right? And you normally think, kite surfers, that's cool. OK, that's cool. But um, for example, the kite surfers, they go and they surf, which is right, which is the big parachute-like thing, and the guys are cutting through the water, right? And they say, this is cool. I'm not making a lot of pollution. I'm just doing this. If you were on your honeymoon and had this, this, this image in your mind that you wanted to go to some tropical island and just see the beautiful trees and the beautiful whatever, maybe that didn't include neon guys in neon spandex, you know, cutting back in front of your view every time, right? So the fact that that one entity, in this case, both recreationally, one entity is using the resource, that's impacting the other person's use of that resource. Same thing for pollution. If I dump all this pollution, I'm getting the benefit of dumping this pollution, but then, oh, by the way, your fish? Sorry, I just screwed your fish, right? You can't, you can't fish here now. So the, this is always the case with resource management, but it's, but it's particularly heightened in the coastal zone. Um, this leads to all kinds of conflicts. And we have all kinds of overlap and dysfunction when it comes to agencies. We'll talk about this when we talk about the oil spill response, for example. Um, but uh, I am in charge of this, right? I'm in charge of this. So that's my job. I'm not in charge of that. I'm in charge of making the port work. I'm not in charge of making sure we have healthy fisheries, for example, those kinds of issues. And then ultimately, or sometimes this comes down to conflicting values. So one person wants to do whale watching, another person wants to do um, hunting or something, right? And, and that, that can be problematic. Here is, is an outline for your final, maybe. These are the five biggest threats to our marine and coastal environments. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm positing this to you. You might have, uh, you might see things slightly differently and you could argue to me differently, but at least these five things, at least, at least the top five things, whether or not you think they're in this exact order or not. Number one is just outright over harvesting, sucking too much of the resource out at a rate that it can't be replenished or, or, or would take a very, very long time to be replenished. Pollution. Pollution, both in the sense of traditional pollution, like having some compounds, chemicals go out in the water, or temperature, or light, or whatever, whatever the, the pollutant is. Climate change is just another form of pollution, but it, it's so massive and, and the consequences are so huge, oftentimes people segregate that from traditional pollution. But in reality, it, it's just another form of pollution. Outright fragmentation or destruction of landscapes or seascapes. And um, that can come from paving over a, a beach. It could come from uh, 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 ripping up a coastal wetland. Um, we, we're, very, we're very creative when it comes to destroying habitat, uh, our species is. Uh, number four would be introduce species. Things that were not naturally in that area have come in and in many cases radically changed the functioning of the dynamics of these systems. Things like um, uh, some of our invasive cord grasses, things like some of our non-native beach uh, dune vegetation, etc. And then, really important, institutional lameness institutional ineffectiveness. 
not able, our, our, our political structures in, in many cases are not able to deal with these overlapping uses simultaneously. And, and this ultimately is driven by the fact that these individual managers or individual entities have different priorities and emphases for what they want the coastal zone to be. Okay, uh, do you guys need a break yet? No? Jeez, you're being too polite. I'll go a couple more slides and we'll take, I'll force you to take a break. How about that? All right. So um, what are we looking at here? We're looking at PCH. We're looking at something that um, is very, very sad to me. And I have to talk quickly, otherwise I'll start to cry. So when I was a kid, this was part of my family's traditions. So we would go in Northern California, we'd go up and we would go harvest abalone. And we'd do it in the summer. And, and it was all very traditional in that the, the dudes had their roles, the ladies had their roles, the kids had their roles. So in this case, this was intertidal harvesting of abalone. So the men, good, the men, would go down into the surf and act like men. And they would pop abalones off, these snails, these mollusks. Then they would give them to the kids. The kids would run them up the cliffs. And then the women would be at picnic tables and the women would, would, would cut. And so with abalone, you eat the foot. How many people have ever had wild abalone? Yeah, see, it's, it's crazy. So, so the abalone fishery down here closed in 1997. So in graduate school, some of the ways we paid, we, we, we sustained ourselves over the summer was eating fish and eating abalone and eating lobster. You can't, if we go out to Santa Rosa, you guys can't do that now, even if it wasn't a national park. The populations don't support that. Um, but the time, so, so then the women w w w w would cut up the abalone and you pound it, you tenderize it, usually with a beer bottle, because my family's a bunch of alcoholics. And you get bam, 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 bam. And then we had abalone steaks. And they would go in the, and then we barbecue them fresh. And then they would go in the freezer, or go in the, in the coolers, and then everybody would take some home. And that's what we would, uh, not every day, of course, but that was you know, a, a key thing we'd eat throughout the year. Does not exist anymore because we poorly manage this resource. This, this resource, though, has an incredibly interesting history. And we'll get into this later in the semester. But it tells us about the ecological functioning of it. It touches on racial inequality, environmental justice. It touches on cu preserving cultures. Um, what happened here was this, these are folks that are uh, working on the railroad. We brought over a lot of folks from Asia, especially China. A lot of folks in California refer to them as the celestials. And uh, these folks were um, low on the totem pole, right? They were foreigners. They, they, they got this reputation as these this otherworldly people because they maintain their culture. They like to drink tea. So they rarely l missed a day building the railroads through, through the Sierras. All the stupid white folks that didn't, like, I want to drink some water out of the stream. Oh, man, you got dysentery. You're, you're messing yourself and you can't work for three days. Maybe you even dehydrate and die. Rarely happened to these folks. So the, so the, so the, so the, so the um, Asian community, especially the Chinese community, was very close-knit. And because they got known as hard workers, they got special treats. So they could get some things like tangerines and, and had their own special meals. And so they, they maintained their cultural identity. And so when some of those folks raised enough money to not be doing slave labor on the railroads, they came down to the coast and they started doing things like harvesting abalone. And so they became the original, um, after the Native Americans, after we slaughtered those folks and they stopped harvesting the, the um, abalone, uh, the, the Chinese folks moved on in. And um, in this case, this is a picture in Monterey, but you can look at this massive production here. We'll talk about why there was so many abalone that has to do with how we were also screwing with the sea otters at the same time. who. Normally, the sea otters would, have be, would be sucking up much of this produ uh, productivity. But, but this is, so all of a sudden, these guys started dr thinking, oh, this is a wonderful resource. Most white folks think it's lame and it's not worthy. These guys love it, right? It's a delicacy to them. So they, they turn you know, whole industries um, on their heads by doing this production. And there's all kinds of interesting things going on. Uh, uh, initially, they were just going from um, uh, the land, the intertidal with poles, Eventually, they, they do hard hat diving, especially the Japanese community around Monterey was really big doing that. And they establish these coastal settlements. Um, so we have 
for example, one of our monitoring sites in northern San Francisco Bay is called China Camp. There's a China Camp everywhere. There's a China Camp here, China Camp there, because there were so many populations of folks doing all kinds of things, but, but exploiting abalone was a key part of what they were doing. And people have now gone back in places like Channel Islands and actually excavated some of these things. And maybe you guys have done some of this uh, on some of your time out on Santa Rosa and actually try to reconstruct what the life was like 100, 150 years ago for these, for these um, immigrant communities. But of course, right, they were an other. And as soon as people started figuring out that they could make money doing this, let's get these folks out. So we actually have specific law or had specific laws in California to get these Asians out these weird freakazoid people, right? Because they were making too much money and they were doing this and that. Um, right. So uh, here's an example. Again, we'll talk about this longer. This is the abalone farm. If we do go up to do our Central Coast tour, this is the largest abalone farm in North America. They're farming red abalone. There's about a million abalone growing here right now. This is just on the coastal bluff. This is just above Cayucos just you know, 10 minutes north of Morro Bay, basically. Um, and a really, really very interesting spot. Um, essentially, the vast majority of the legal supply of our abalone, if you guys go into a restaurant now, a high-end restaurant, and you order some abalone, whatever, it's coming from these, these farmed aquaculture facilities, not wild by and large. Um, and so here we see the peak decade of production. So abalone are ranked based on how tender they are. So the best ones are things like whites and pinks. You basically never have to, I told my, you know, all the ladies are pound, 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 tenderizing it to make the, the foot, the muscle uh, tender enough so when you cook it, it's not super tough. Um, the best abalone, you don't have to do that at all. And so we've first exploited the easiest to cook, the best tasting abalone, then we went to the next, to the next, to the next. And so here you see the peak decade and the commercial landings so the pinks peaked in, in the 50s, then greens in the 60s to 70s, blacks in the 70s to 80s, white abalone from the late, late 60s to mid 70s, and threaded um, in the 70s to 80s. Um, this is the commercial landings, right? And this is what they, um, when people harvest these things now, most, most of the case you can't harvest them. This is right before we closed the abalone fishery down. Uh, in the late 90s, it was but a fraction of this. So we're, we're talking what's left, a percent of what used to be there, a tenth of a percent, a hundredth of a percent. So we're not talking about, oh, we lost half of them. We're talking about we lost almost all of the biomass in these species. In fact, white abalone, our very first marine invertebrate listed on the Endangered Species Act. Let's talk a little bit about um, some fisheries. And we, can, we, can have, we will talk about and we'll read all kinds of examples over the course of the semester about examples of fisheries. But let's start with this one. This one is World War I. There are actually more monuments to World War I than any other war uh, in the U uh, uh, more monuments across the United States than any other war, which is kind of weird because we don't typically think of World, World War I, right? We think of World War II, we think of the Civil War, we think of Vietnam War. This was a crazy war. This was the first big modern industrial scale slaughtering of human beings. And it brought, a lot, a lot, brought about a lot of, um, well, it was spurred on. And then in the course of the war, it, was, um, it in turn created a lot of innovation in terms of technologies. One of the things that happened was a lot of these, these folks that were overseas were getting cruddy food. They were getting canned food that was not properly, uh, that was not sterilized, and so they would the, ca the cans would spoil. And these guys were this was trench warfare. They couldn't just up and go, you know, walk back somewhere. They were physically stuck in a, in a specific location. They were getting rotten food, so that spurred on this huge um, need for for um, safe food, but also high energy foods, so that these these soldier folks that oftentimes were in miserable cold conditions would have enough. Uh, energy to fight and do stuff like that. So the big invention was the canning of sardines. And so uh, one of the big industries here in California that was birthed from this was the sardine industry around Monterey Bay. And these folks did, uh, what, essentially what they figured out was they could take these, these fish, very abundant, plentiful, athrinids, and they could catch them in huge volumes, uh, huge numbers, bring them in, uh, uh, Throw, uh, throw, cook them, cook them in the cans, and then 
and then cap them and, and, and they could cook the cans themselves make them super super hot so you didn't have to cook something and then carry it through the factory floor where it's picking up bacteria or whatever then putting it in and then not properly sealing it so so it was both the targeting of this fish but also this packaging of this fish that really birthed the sardine industry and so here's a classic example you see this 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 boat is full from gunnel to gunnel full of fish and a typical boat would go out for eh, i don't know three times a day they'd go out get you know as you know every single square inch of the boat is full of fish turn around motor in dump them off of the dock go back out and, and keep going this is a map from the 1920s so just just uh, in the wake of world war one and this is uh very rare data actually because fishermen don't ever like to tell you where they fish right yeah i fish where'd you fish over there where over there <laughs> so in this case these guys have plotted this and these are all the locations where the, this fishing fleet was fishing over this one fishing season. So check it out. It's not normally distributed, right? So the critters are responding to some structure in the environment and they are concentrating themselves because of currents, because of habitat, whatever, in a certain location. And the fishermen have figured this out. They have these motorized vessels, they can track them and they are, they are obviously hitting them pretty darn hard very close to what we now consider downtown Mount Monterey. What, the location that John Steinbeck lionized in some of his novels and the location now of the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Our coastal zone birthed modern biology in high schools that we now know of. Anybody know who this guy is right here? Yes, exactly. Uh, Ed Ricketts is his name. So he is, he is the, the, the grandfather of marine, coastal ecology, intertidal ecology. He um, was, an, was a crazy guy, awesome dude. Um, drank way too much, partied way too much, did what he wanted. He created what's called the Pacific, wait, what was it? Pacific, yeah, Pacific Biological Laboratories. It's still there. If you go to the, next time you go to the, if, if we go up there on that trip, I'll point it out to you guys. It's just, if you're looking, if your butt is towards the land and your face is towards the ocean and you're looking at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, it's just to the exact right. It's the next building over to the right. It's now owned by a bunch of folks that have a sort of private club there. But Pacific, so this is a guy, right? This was, this was you know, 100 years ago. Well, maybe, maybe. Yeah, yeah, 100 years ago. It was about 100 years ago. Um, I want to do my own thing. He went out and he just started collecting stuff. Collected frogs, collected urchins, collected octopus, and then shipped these things around the country, mostly to universities, but especially high schools. And so that birthed this, really helped give a huge shot in the arm to um, students learning about circulatory systems, people learning about... Um, uh, respiratory systems, all the stuff you guys did in high school, you dissected the frogs and this and that. This was the guy that was supplying these things. There, there was not a big industry. There was not a, a Carolina biological supply to send stuff. So he started doing this and he was spent so much time. He was such a fantastic natural historian, such a wonderful observer of the natural world. He actually wrote that book Between Pacific Tides, which has never gone out of print. It's a fantastic Bible for the ecology of the intertidal coined the term intertidal zonation all kinds of great stuff um, and then he was such a character that's who Steinbeck hung out with and so Doc the character Doc in Cannery Row was based on this guy Tortilla Flats Steinbeck liked him so much he said hey let's go on a, a nerd let's go nerd out so they went on a got, a got a boat and they sailed down to the Sea of Cortez and they wrote a, a book called the Log of the, or something, what is it? Log of the, blah, 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 the Sea of Cortez. I can't remember the full title off the top of my head. But um, uh, about 10 years ago, that was repeated by scientists. And, and that, that merging of an author and a scientist produced this fantastic data set that when we replicated it a few years ago, um, showed clear evidence of species shifting, most likely due to climate change. So really cool stuff. That all, that all came in this case from someone with a very careful eye. A whole industry was birthed by having a careful natural historian's eye being applied to the coastal zone. 
And so, so these are all, this is Steinbeck. And, um, and so the coastal zone in this case really helped nurture his writing, which turned into Pulitzer Prize winning um, pieces of literature and uh, provided a lens with which to look at inequality in the US. Then the fishery crashes, partly because of overharvesting, mostly because of a uh, changed oceanic regime and everything tanks. And so it, it falls in disrepair. So Monterey was a sketch place. Monterey, when I was born, was not the kind of place you want to just go hang out and it was boring. It was not super safe. There was nothing to do. So then these guys named Hewlett and Packard invented a little, did some inventing some stuff and basically got super crazy rich. And then um, uh, Julie Packard, um, went to school, got a marine biology degree and didn't know what to do and said, hey, let's make a let's make a let's make a zoo basically for the ocean. And so they were looking around and they, they found this incredibly cheap land. So this area, these abandoned tuna fish production facilities and uh, sardine production facilities um, were big, huge warehousey type spaces. They bought them up. And now this is a huge thing. Right. So now we have four million visitors a year to the Monterey Bay Aquarium, massive shot in the arm of the economy, um, uh, incredibly important for educating people about the ocean, etc. And so, again, these things are feeding off of one another. So something burbles up in the coastal zone, inspires something, it changes and inspires something else, and it keeps on going and going. And so then that's where we get to this weirdo guy that we started the lecture off with. This guy's an artist. This guy's named George Sumner. He's a famous environmental painter, oil painter, and uh, does all kinds of abstracts, but he's, he's perhaps most known for his sea life, whales and dolphins. So here, this guy is inspecting this whale because he's painting, he's learned how to paint whales. And he turns that into so, so these incredible paintings and fantastic outreach to people around the planet. And so this whale is where it is because of the incredible productivity of the coastal zone. That whale died, but it was so close to shore because it was feeding off of the, the biological everything that this part of the ocean generated. So this guy, this is during the, this is during the Cold War. And so uh, Gorbachev comes to the US as part of Gorbachev's talk, he goes to the Hoover Institution, which is next to my old office at Stanford. The Hoover Institution is a very conservative place that really was anti-communist, etc. So Gorbachev goes there, goes to the, the epicenter of the, the commie haters in his peace trip. So this guy, George Sumner, runs down with one of his paintings that's you know, taller than your head. It's like a six foot tall painting. And he runs down, not invited, and pulls the painting out of his van and just it was you know, just about a crowd of people and just holds it up. And Gorbachev is walking in to go talk global politics and should we have some kind of peace between the West and the East. And he sees this painting of these, in this case, these two dolphins kissing and their bellies are flushed, informed by the productivity of the coastal zone, informed by this artist getting inspiration for the coastal zone. And Gorbachev comes over and starts to talk to this guy. And he talks to him for 10 minutes straight. And all the security guys are like, no, 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 we cannot stand here. We must go inside, not safe. He's like, ah, screw you. We're talking about this stuff. So they have this whole conversation about um, the coastal zone and the environment and the symbol of two dolphins coming together. And the, be the dolphins' bellies are slightly flush pink, which is, means they're a little uh, amorous, shall we say. And, and this, this image of world peace. So he says, I want to give this painting to the people of Russia as a present from the people of the U.S. And that painting is now in a uh, museum in Moscow. And was was a very so it was so powerful that when Gorbachev comes back to the U.S., he asks this artist to do another painting, and Gorbachev uses it for his foundation, etc. So this a product a very productive coastal zone can have far-reaching implications, right? It can lead to not this didn't cause world peace, but but was one small step in trying to break down the this you know age-old animosity. So there we go. So um, uh, the coastal zone is an awesome place. I'm obviously biased. I like the coast. But we can spin this up very easily. Spinning isn't the right word. There are direct implications for our economy, 
for how, we, how our environment goes, how our populations go, how our society treats other members of our society, et cetera. So the cozone is really this awesome lens with which to look at a huge number of things. We're gonna focus primarily on the, on the short-term immediate management, but don't forget these things we're talking about. Don't forget the implication of, of food sources and the implication of, of creativity and art and recreation. We'll, talk, we'll touch on all these things as we go throughout the semester.